Hello, F Sharp. We are continuing our journey learning the basics of F Sharp. In this series, what I'm hoping to do is introduce you to all the basic concepts that are inside the F Sharp language so that you're familiar with them and know how to use them and when, when you should use one approach versus the other. Now, today, what we're going to talk about is structs. Now, structs are an interesting thing in that they're not really emphasized in F Sharp. Although F Sharp has really fantastic support for structs, most of the time in F Sharp, you'll see things like records, discriminated unions, those classes of types. But structs become incredibly important when we care about performance. And the reason for that is like an F Sharp record, and let me create one right now, and I'm going to just create uh, my silly one that I always do chicken. And chicken has a name field of string and a size of float. <laughs> this is an F sharp record. It is a ref type or a reference type. So when you create an instance of chicken, that memory is being allocated on the heap. Now in high performance code, you don't necessarily want to be allocating lots of things in the heap because that's going to put pressure on the garbage collector. And then you might have pauses as your program needs to stop running for a little bit so that the garbage collector can collect objects that are no longer being used. Now, structs are types that are allocated on the stack by default. It's actually a little bit more nuanced than that, but for now, let's just go with that simplification. And the way I can turn an F sharp record into a struct is by simply adding the struct attribute. Now, when I hover over chicken, you're going to see some changes in the IntelliSense. We're saying like, hey, chicken is a struct type and it has two fields, name and size. If I remove the name attribute and I hover over it, it's saying, hey, chicken is a record type with fields of name and size. So I'm going to uncomment that so we get our structiness back. And now we have a struct. It's allocated on the stack which means that the garbage collector doesn't have to keep track of this. So this is really fantastic. Now there's implications when you start passing these types to other functions and methods, but we're not going to get into that today. Uh, the idea of pass by ref, pass by value is, is deserves a video of its own. So for now, this is how we create a struct. This is one way. There, there are four that we're going to go over. This is one way to define a struct in F sharp. And it's probably the easiest one, the first one you'll come across. The reason I like this approach is because most of the time you've actually modeled your domain just using F sharp records because that's the default. It's a safe default. There's nothing wrong with that. When we start examining the performance of our application, we say like, hey, we have lots of allocations going on, lots of garbage collection. Then we might start coming back and re-examining this. So this is one of the first things that you can do to make your F sharp record a struct. Now, the great thing about this is that from a code perspective, nothing here has really changed. You can still create instances the same way you would an F sharp record. So I have name equal to plucky and then size equal to 10. This is the exact same syntax that you would use for creating a normal F sharp record. It's just it's creating a structy record now. I can also use the update, the with update syntax. So if I want to say, hey, I want to say C1 with size now equal to 2.0, I can do that as well. So I'm taking the values from C1 and then I'm updating one of the fields. This is the with update syntax for F sharp records. And again, these are all structs. So there's no allocation going on in the heap, no pressure for the garbage collector. Great. This is fantastic. What are the other ways that we can define structs in F sharp? Well, the first one that I want to show is again using this struct attribute here at the top. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I'm going to call this one turkey. And I'm going to say, hey, value name of string and value size of float. So you see that this looks a little bit different. I this is not an F sharp record. If we hover over it, it's still going to say it's a struct of Turkey, but now we can't use this 
record syntax for creating instances of turkey. Let me go ahead and sh show that to you. So T1, and I'm gonna put a type hint in to say like, hey, I really want you to make this a turkey. And I'm gonna say name is equal to um, gobble. In English, we say the, the sound that a turkey makes is gobble, gobble, gobble. So if you're wondering why that name, size is equal to 30, uh, yeah, 30. And the compiler is complaining saying, hey, this expression was expected to have type turkey, but here it has type chicken. And what is going on is the type inference is seeing the shape of this. It's saying, oh, you're trying to create an instance of a record. Let me go look at the records that match this shape. It's finding chicken, but this, um, I've told the type inference, I really expect this expression to the right to be a turkey. And so there's a conflict here. We can't use this syntax for creating instances of structs that are defined this way. So what would we have to do to do that? Well, there's, what we can do is we can define a constructor for it. So we said name and then size. And now what we can do is, now we can use that syntax, name and size equal to size. So now what has happened is, is I've defined a constructor for turkey. So now what I can do is to say like, hey, I want to create an instance of turkey and its name is gobble and it is size 20. And this will work. We can go ahead and run this code here just to kind of prove what I'm saying. Uh, let me just zoom out just a tiny bit. So here I'm defining the type turkey and I've created an instance of turkey and I want to print out the values of it. So it says, hey, uh, it has a name gobble and a size of 20. So the, we can also have multiple constructors. Let's see, like, hey, let's just have a name. I can actually just do this. I need to have that. And I can say like, hey, name is going to be equal to name. I'm gonna give size and give that a default of one for some reason. So now I can actually define multiple different constructors for Turkey. Now what's tricky is that what you may not realize is like, hey, I had no curly braces here. And when we define classes in F-sharp and in C-sharp, you, ooh, no, don't trust what I say about C-sharp. It's been a long time since I've written any, but you would often have, you know, constructor arguments here. So what's actually happening, so T0 is equal to turkey. I'm creating an instance of turkey here. Where's the constructor code that's being called? It's not here. Well, in this case, Case, when you define a struct this way, there is an implicit constructor going on behind the hood. And that implicit constructor is setting the values of these fields to just zeros. Just, yeah, it's, it's the default value for these things. And so string is gonna, be, so let me go ahead and create this. And let me go ahead and say, print out the values. And saying like, hey, the name, which is supposed to be a string field, is null, so it's just a null string, and the size is zero. So these are just getting the default values when I'm using this implicit constructor, which is what's going on here. It's, it's hidden away from you. Now you may be saying, hey, I really don't want there to be this implicit constructor. Well, unfortunately for structs, the fact that there are value types, there's always gonna be a implicit constructor of some type. So there's no real way around that. So just kind of realize that that's a possibility. And it's, and it's because the fact they're value types. They have to be initialized with some type of data. So what F sharp will do is it will default that. So let's talk about another way you can define a struct. It's actually very similar to these. Um, maybe that's eh, a little bit shorter. And so this time we're going to define a goose. And again, it has a name, which is a string, and it has a size, which is a float. And what we're going to say is, whoop, and say like, hey, I'm gonna expose these values to the outside using a member name equal to name and member size equal to size. So what is going on here? Structurally, all these things that I've defined so far is exactly the same. These are all structs. They all have a name field, which is a string and a size field, which is a float. So under the hood, if you look at how they're laid out in memory, they're all exactly the same. What's different here now though is 
Well, I mean, these, I mean, I'm basically syntactically saying the same thing in different ways. I mean, these two, turkey and goose, are essentially just the same thing. Even to prove the point, um, what I'm going to try to do is define a name string and say, like, hey, I'm going to create an instance of goose name, and I'm going to say the default value is zero. So syntactically, goose and turkey are now the same. It's just said two different ways at this point. Now, the difference is that I'm explicitly defining these property members for exposing these values. Uh, and just to prove a point, that implicit structure is still here. Uh, so g1 is equal to goose. I can still create an instance of goose, and it will still default to those empty well, those zeroed out values. So let's run that. Yeah, name null size zero. So this is one of the air quotes dangers of using structs. It's possible to create these empty instances. So be aware. The there are things that we could do to like really lock it down. But if at the point that we're using structs and we care about performance, like locking things down may not be what we're interested in. Now, if this is an external facing API that customers and other developers are using, that's a whole different discussion. I'm assuming that we're creating code that we're consuming in our own code base. That's a different thing. So you got these two different syntaxes that are speaking the same thing. Um, when would you prefer one over the other? Um, the main thing is when you want things to be mutable. Because right now, we don't have a good way of saying if any of these fields are mutable because, hey, we're, we're creating, we're passing them in. They are these private fields by default and we're exposing them using properties. So there's no way for me to say whether, hey, maybe I want size to be mutable. I know, F sharp is immutable by default, and we will have a whole thing talking about mutability in the future. And mutability becomes really important in high performance scenarios, but we don't have an easy way of saying that either name or size are mutable fields. Whereas if we were over here, we could say, like, hey, you know what? Size is now mutable. So this is why I tend to default to this way of defining structs. I mean, typically what I do is I'm starting with this because I've, I've modeled things with F sharp records because that's the nice, easy and simple things to do. Then you start using some profiling and say like, hey, I'm gonna throw that struct attribute on some things. And then from there, I would air quotes, graduate to this representation of a struct. It's a little bit more verbose. It doesn't give me the nice with update syntax. That's really nice to use, but it allows me some finer grain control. Technically you could put mutable on here as well. Um, could do that. I like, yeah, I'm just saying I often kind of default to this because I'm often doing some type of additional logic process in the constructor or not. So I like this because it's very clearly I am doing something very purposeful with the structiness of something versus an F sharp record. I don't know. Let me show you the last way to define a struct in F sharp, and that's probably the weirdest syntax. And it's in there, it's in the spec. I don't know if I've ever seen it used in the real world though. And this one is gonna be type, what? Okay, we have turkey, we have goose, we have chicken, and we have, I don't know, what's another bird um, that we have? Hawk, let's see we're just randomly raising hawks. <laughs> um, uh, interesting farm we got going on. That, that, the fact that we have a hawk and a chicken, that may not work out well. So we can have struct end and then member, nope, val name string and val size. Quote. Now, instead of having the struct attribute up here, we've identified this as a struct by using the struct and end. Um, keywords to say like, hey, this is a struct. I have no idea why this syntax exists. It's kind of bizarre to me. It might have something to do with OCaml roots. I don't know. I just find it odd. At the same time though, 
we need to define some kind of constructor for this if we want to be able to chain if we want to be able to create instances of hawk with initial values so again we'd have to say like new name size and we use the same syntax of name name and size equals new size yay and so now we can create our hawks again hawk and chicken on the same farm bad call h1 equal to hawk and this is going to be hockey i know i am very creative that is, this is why I dev good. So 10. So there we go. We can create a our hawk type here and we'll see what values are in there. Yep, we have our hawk. His name is hockey and his size is 10. If we hover over this, we see, yep, this is a struct uh, with a constructor. Still, it has it has the default constructor here. So if we wanted to create an empty instance, that still exists. So be aware, no matter which technique that you have, uh, you're going to have this uh, situation unless you make everything private. And that's, again, that's another discussion. So these are the four different ways you can define structs in F sharp. I, like I said, I tend to default with this at the beginning of my projects as I'm modeling out because record is nice, safe default in F sharp. And then I will start graduating to something like this if I want. It's not even like more control. It's just I like this syntax and I am typically wanting constructors at this point. But uh, let it let let your use case guide you. I I do sometimes use this. Actually, I use this when in. I use this in our collections for our simulation engine, but I use it for our, our special collections, the row and bar types. I'll have another video in the future where I go into the engineering of those. So I do use this syntax at times for very particular purposes, but there's no real advantage. To it. I'm not saying like, oh, this is allowing me to do something I couldn't do with the other. Thing. So really, these are the two that you're probably going to be using the most. These other two are important to be aware of. So as you're reading other people's code, you know what it's doing, but there you go. So I hope this was a helpful introduction to structs in F sharp, how to define them, how to create instances of them. In the future, we're going to talk about passing structs around and what is passed by reference. Uh, how do we manage mutability? Because that's a whole thing that we need to utilize to write high performance F sharp code. So, until, if, if you have any questions, please leave questions in the comments about things that weren't clear or things that you want me to cover in the future. I'd really appreciate the feedback because I'm creating this for you and I want it to be helpful for you. So please let me know what it is that you want me to be going into more depth. Until next time, thank you very much. It's been really wonderful chatting with you. Have a nice day.